Hey there, Commanders. We're going to do a Federal Corvette build tonight. This platform remains one of my favorite in the entire game just because of the sheer flipping flexibility that this ship offers, second only to the Anaconda in my opinion, and in some ways it even surpasses it. Though the Federal Corvette's strong combat focus and lack of jump range does make it less versatile in the exploration and general travel department, it still has enough cargo to be a reasonable short-range trader and a very powerful escort ship if you're ever flying in a wing. It also is an extremely strong miner. I have detailed a mining build in one of my previous Federal Corvette videos you can refer back to. It's called the Dust Runner. This is a strong PvE-focused combat ship, capable of action in combat zones or in hazardous resource extraction sites. You can also use this in pirate beacons, although I recommend being in a wing anytime you go into a pirate beacon since you're going up against other engineered ships. Now, some of this build can be tuned to your level of engineering and power play module unlocks. I'll go over those details when we get there. So, core internals. Reactive surface composite, heavy duty grade five, deep plating. Pretty much the standard for all PVE focused human combat ships where you know you're not going to be fighting Thargoids. 8A power plant, armored grade 5 and monstered. 7A thrusters, dirty grade 5 and drag drives. There are some large ships where I don't recommend this combination, but the Federal Corvette is maneuverable and fast enough that it can leverage these pretty well, although keep in mind that fast enough is 367 meters per second. One of the reasons why the Federal Corvette has never succeeded in general PvP compared to something like the Ferdilance is because it's just too slow. The current combat meta in Elite Dangerous is very focused on high top-end boost speed. None of the large ships, save for the Imperial Cutter, are competitive in that department. And even the Cutter struggles against something like a Ferdilance because it drifts so hard. Now, the Cutter does make up for that with sheer flipping shield power. Um, it's quite obnoxious to fight in most situations where you see it in PvP because it requires multiple vessels to focus it down in order to crack those shields. We can get into the ins and outs of combat strategy later, but where the Federal Corvette really comes into its own is the weapons it comes with, so I'll, uh, I'll get to that here in just a sec. 6A frame shift drive, shielded grade 5 double braced. You can range boost this, and if you have a brewer drive unlocked you can put that in here. That will get you, you know, close to 20 light years. Federal Corvette's extremely heavy, and its frameshift drive is undersized for the platform. One of the trade offs that it brings to bear, and it's kind of a nightmare to overcome. So much so that, that I've given up even bothering with it at this point, although I'm far enough in the game that I have a fleet carrier. You can drag it around the bubble if you're patient. If you intend on doing that, you should probably stick a fuel scoop in here somewhere. Um, it, it really is an easier ship to use if you have a fleet carrier or know a friend who has a fleet carrier or you have a strongly established home station that's somewhere in the bubble you don't like to move around with. Otherwise, this isn't a very strong travel ship, and I don't recommend trying to force it to be one unless you're willing to make sacrifices in your ability to withstand shields down situations. But 20 light years is nothing to shake a stick at, so it's your call there. 5A life support, reinforced grade 5, because we're in a warship and light weighting this is the difference between like 2 meters per second. I can even show you right here if we go from reinforced to lightweight, the boost speed doesn't even change. Top end speed goes, or sorry, cruising speed goes up just a little bit, but only by 1 meter per second. So reinforced blueprints are pretty cheap and easy to come by. I typically recommend them whenever you're dealing with large platform ships, especially since losing your shields typically means that different core internals are going to get constantly drilled on. The frame shift drive is a favorite target. So if you ever get your shields down in a PVP situation, this is probably the first thing they're going to try to kill. If, uh, if not that, then your thrusters, because you know, the integrity is low enough that these can get shot out pretty easily if you show the enemy your rear. 8A power distributor, charge enhanced grade 5 with super conduits. Pretty much the only option when it comes to the Federal Corvette, unless you plan on running a really conservative pulse laser multi cannon build. Then you could actually get away with shielding the power distributor. If you were going to build a core hull tank and knew that you were going to run into a PvP situation, 
you can definitely shake up a, a PvPer's day, but Super Pen Railguns are just so powerful in a protracted fight, eventually, stuff in here is going to break. 8A Sensors, Long Range Grade 5. Pretty much the only option here because the Federal Corvette is one of the only ships to offer 8A sensors and is one of the farthest ranged sensing ships in the entire game at 13.41 kilometers. You've got close to half of the instance available to you at any given moment, making the Federal Corvette an incredibly powerful spotter ship when you're doing wing engagements in a Hazrez. You can see basically all of the pirates at any given time, and you can help guide your wingmates to potentially juicy targets. The 5C fuel tank is left untouched. Optional internals. This is a balanced mixture of shield and hull tank. If you favor a particular type of build, you can sacrifice shielding for additional hull reinforcement packages. I don't typically recommend this in most situations, although this is coming from a guy who owns a hull tank Type 10. Um, the, the problem that hull tanks have, even against PvE situations, is that hull damage is forever, and the repair limpet is largely irrelevant in most situations, especially with an engineered hull. It just takes too long to do anything. If that ever gets addressed in the future, I think we'll see hull tanks become a more popular, potentially viable option in more PvE situations. Outside of AX engagements, I just don't see that happening, though. Um, AX being the one exception where hull tanks are actually relatively common. 7B, shield cell bank, in the top slot, rapid charge grade 4 with boss cells. This is the PVE-focused shield cell bank. If you get into a PVP situation, you've got 1,620 megajoules of shield power available to you, which is enough to get away, making this an open safe build. It is not enough to deal with a protracted engagement, because with this shield cell configuration, you're probably never going to be able to get a full bank in before you get cancelled by a feedback cascade railgun. Um, just for the record, even if you did PvP focus the shield cell bank by selecting specialized grade 4, and then for the experimental choosing recycling cell, um, you're still so big and present such a massive cross-section, you're probably not going to be able to successfully bank against something like a Ferdy Lance. It's very difficult to do, it takes a lot of practice, and the margins for error are extremely small. 7A, Universal Multi-Limpet Controller. If you're doing PvE situations, this new controller is now your best friend. If you're into combat salvaging, want to collect materials while you're out and about, or want to turn this into one of the most powerful multi-mission ships in the game, you now have the option to do that on the cheap, costing you only one module where it might cost you two or three to put everything on here. This Federal Corvette has the ability to be a pirate, a hostage rescuer, a super ship raider, a general salvager collector. It can do any number of things, and with a size 7 cargo rack right down here, You've got plenty of room for plunder, for limpets, for just about anything that you can stick in there. 6D, Fighter Hangar. In PvE situations, having an extra vessel with you at all times to draw fire is an extremely useful utility. In PvP situations or in wings, you do have to be careful about the ship launch fighter potentially messing up the netcode. Um, just be aware of what your friends are reporting, and if you hear them talk about rubber banding, uh, have your fighter recall if which usually um, it can help clean the situation up. 6A, Prismatic Shield Generator. If you want an overview of how shields work in Elite Dangerous, you can see my dedicated new player tutorial on the topic. When you're running a shield cell bank, it's actually a good idea to oversize the bank compared to the shield generator because it offers you more theoretical shield potential. You'll see here in Coriolis, the shield cell bank above has a total of 3,097 megajoules of shield capacity stored inside it. When added with the 1620 we've got up here, that gives us just north of 4600 total megajoules of shielding, and it doesn't cost very much power to do that. If you flip them the other way, you would have a higher base absolute shield pool that your ship can draw from, giving you more endurance in a PvP situation, but you would end up with less overall total theoretical shield capacity because a 6 B shield cell bank would store much less than 3,000 megajoules. So, as a general rule, anytime you know you want to run shield cell banks and you're building a shield tank oriented ship, 
it's a good idea to have the shield cell bank be at least one size larger than the shield generator. I wouldn't go much past two because then you run into situations where the shield cell bank's uh, individual shield reinforcement ends up being larger than your shield's actual capacity, and that's just waste. 5D, Module Reinforcement Package. I always recommend having at least one of these on a combat ship where you can fit it. It increases your module internal endurance, giving you a lot more ability to take damage, especially if the weapons that are attacking you do internal damage. You can put a Guardian Module Reinforcement Package in here, but be prepared to power manage because this build is running with only 0.4% reactor capacity available to be spent on something. 5D hull reinforcement package. In typical fashion, all of the 5D packages are heavy duty grade 5 with deep plating. I always recommend this for combat ships because it maximizes absolute hull endurance, and this is a very survivable hull. In fact, we're actually quite hull biased when it comes to shield and hull mixtures right now. I like that because it makes things very forgiving in the event you lose your prismatics, and you are going to probably lose your prismatics over an extended engagement, so just be aware of that. If you want to increase combat endurance and pull away from PvP engagements in general, then you can swap this prismatic shield generator out for a biweave. Um, keep in mind, though, that large ships don't apply biweaves very well, and you are highly reliant on being able to control your engagements. In a Hazrez, this is typically done by waiting and aggroing small groups of pirates between individual engagement sessions. But in a combat zone, Especially if you start getting focused down by special ops ships, you can lose your biweaves very, very quickly. It's harder to chew through absolute shielding from a prismatic shield generator than it is from absolute shielding on a biweave. So just uh, be aware of the trade off there. It's quite an aggressive one. 4H Planetary Vehicle Hanger. This is in here to increase your multi role capability, allowing you to do some Odyssey content if you happen to have it unlocked, or just to land and tool around on a planet's surface collecting materials, should that suit your fancy. 4D Hull Reinforcement Package. This is also heavy duty grade 5 and deep plating. 3D FSD Interdictor. Extended Capture Arc Grade 4. The only blueprint that matters on FSD interdictors. And 3D, specifically because range doesn't really matter. If you're following typical procedure when hunting for a target or waiting for one to arrive in a system, you'll be orbiting a reasonable distance from the central star with more supercruise momentum available to you. This means when you want to close in on a target, you just have to fly generally in an aftward direction, and uh, you'll pick him up as long as you're within the capture arc range, which is what this facing limit is about. I have always preferred extended capture arc to extended range. So if you're going to go out and hunt specific marks on the mission board, um, really, it doesn't matter what the rating of your FSD interdictor is. As long as you've got that facing limit and super cruise momentum advantage, you're going to catch the target. And against NPCs, it's really not that hard to get an interception. 1D hull reinforcement package, thermal resistant grade 5 and reflective plating to balance the resistances in the armor pool, giving us a reasonable resistance in the low to mid 40s across shields and hull total. Hard points, short range grade 5, oversized. Plasma accelerators are extremely brutal weapons, and the Federal Corvette, because of its phenomenal turn rate, applies them extremely well. However, because it's so slow, I've never found situations where long range has been all that useful. In fact, NPCs are really stupid. They'll close to point-blank range and attack you like complete dunces every single time. So you may as well take advantage of their stupidity and run the biggest, nastiest cannon you can possibly run. Plasma accelerators combined will deal more than 100 points of partially absolute damage, making it extremely powerful against shields. This will be the primary way that you break shields on bigger and some smaller NPC ships. Um, short range and oversized pooled together is definitely the way to go. If you don't want to worry about ammo and want to increase your overall combat endurance, you can switch to plasma slug, but it sacrifices a significant amount of damage, and it will draw from your fuel reserve, so be careful because you can evaporate all the fuel in your tank over extended fights if you're not paying attention. 
Um, I don't recommend any of the other fancy experimentals that come with PAs for PVE because FDEV hasn't built in behavior in the AI that recognizes those experimental effects. So things like target lock breaker and phasing sequence, well, no, phasing sequence works. Target lock breaker and dispersal field is, I believe, the one that screws with your radar. Um, neither one of them work. So uh, I wouldn't bother if you're only going to fight against NPCs. Oh, crap, I just deleted my... Let's see if I can undo that. Nope. Okay, let me put that uh, multi-cannon back in here. Bear with me. 3C. Short range. And auto loader. This is the primary damage dealer if the shields go down and you're fighting against a smaller ship. Uh, plasma accelerators on the Federal Corvette are extremely powerful against medium and large ships, but if you get swarmed by a couple of little eagles these things are like trying to kill a mouse with a sledgehammer. You might get lucky if, you know, the NPC makes a mistake and runs into something, but most of the time, eagles, sidewinders, hell, Cobra 3s can be very difficult targets to hit if they're not presenting their full cross-section to you, and the NPCs are actually okay at not doing that most of the time. So uh, multi-cannons with gimbals specifically help you to deal with those smaller targets, putting out a lot of damage and not a lot of time. An autoloader just helps make sure that you can lay down the punishment for ships stupid enough to close to engagement range with you. And since they're going to be smaller ships, and they're going to be really close, a 3C multi-cannon with short range maximizes damage output. 33.1 kinetic damage is quite a lot for small and medium holes to deal with, so this can also help contribute to killing medium targets that might engage you. Packhounds also assist with this objective. High capacity grade 5 and drag munitions on both pack hounds in the medium slot. This will allow you to eviscerate small ships, ship launch fighters, and even some medium ships. Add in module sub-targeting towards the drives or other key external weapon hardpoints, and you can pretty much declaw the more dangerous of the cats that might try to come after you in short order. The two smalls are both multi-cannons. One with both with high capacity grade 5 as the blueprint, and then one uses emissive munitions as the experimental, while the other uses corrosive shell. The corrosive shell multi cannon is liable to run out before any of the others, so just be aware of it. It will stop working first in protracted engagements, but all of these weapons taken together allow you to really hurt NPCs, grinding down even the strongest of holes in short order. Utility mounts. We have three size A shield boosters in the top three slots. You might shuffle these around depending on how you lay out your point defenses. Um, typically, you want a point defense facing upwards and a point defense facing downwards, covering your dorsal and ventral holes, respectively. Your ventral point defense should be as close to the cargo rack as possible, protecting you from hatchbreaker limpets. The three shield boosters in the top slots are two thermal resistant grade five both with super capacitors to help increase the absolute shield pool. The last shield booster, oh, sorry, is also thermal resistant grade 5 and super capacitor. This limits the amount of power that gets drawn down. It's one of the viable shield mixes that you can put in here. And keep in mind, you're going to get a ton of different opinions from a ton of different people about which one is best. I don't know what the right answer is, depending on the situation. But we've had to make some power compromises on the shields in order to drive these plasma accelerators. They're very expensive weapons to carry on this ship, and the reason why we're actually running multi-cannons and missiles on the rest of the hardpoints is to clear the board for the plasma accelerators to be the primary damage dealer. Um, making sure that they can fire as often as possible and with maximum bars to your weapon capacitor to keep your weapons cool. Now. Even with all of that cooling potential, you're still going to overheat with sustained fire, so shot timing is essential. Add weapon synthesis, premium ammo, for example, to this mixture adds another 30% damage, pushing your damage threshold into one of the highest burst DPSs capable of being created in the entire game. It's a lot of fun if you're willing to put down the engineering work to get this done. And keep in mind, you're going to need basically all of the engineers unlocked to build this thing, and a whole lot of credits. So uh, just be aware, this is quite a project ship to build, but it's a very rewarding ship because it will literally do just about anything as long as there's a landing pad nearby that can support you. 
two point defenses as i mentioned before i have ammo capacity in here but you really don't have to engineer them at all i've never heard of anybody running out of ammo on a point defense it's just a cheap engineering blueprint that you can toss in here feel free to put lightweight reinforced or shield well actually shielded will draw too much power lightweight or reinforced are your other two alternatives of which i favor reinforced because well integrity on external uh module space is more important than being lightweight especially on combat ships uh let's see heat sink launcher ammo capacity this is to uh, unfry your bacon if you get your shot pacing wrong on the plasma accelerator and start to cook um, you can put two heat sink launchers on here i have two chaff launchers on here because they're cheap and it's nice to be able to draw off small ship fire if you're in a tight situation Useless in PvP environments, it would actually be better to just put more heat sink launchers on here. So that mixture I'll leave up to you as the discerning user. You know how you like to play this game. You know what you want to stick in here as far as heat sinks and chaff launchers are concerned. There's basically not a wrong answer as long as you can survive engagements and get back to the station for your payday. Now, one thing you'll note is missing here is the kill warrant scanner. I have personally fallen out of favor with this device because it draws a stupid amount of power in most situations. I would rather just have more shield and more utility capability than maybe 20% extra bounty take. And then even to recover that bounty, you still have to track down in interstellar factors. I've just, I've just found that the effort is disproportionate unless you've got a fleet carrier nearby. And even if you do, I don't go bounty hunting as a primary way of generating revenue anymore. I mostly at the trade markets. When I do go bounty hunting or hitting missions, the kill warrant scanner is just not worth the resource draw that it has on this particular ship build. Now, if you swapped out the plasma accelerators for another hard point setup, you could clear out enough power to be able to run a kill warrant scanner in here. I've just found that it, it doesn't play very nice with this layout, unless you're willing to lean all the way into being a shield tank with a guardian reactor or an overcharged power plant. Problem with doing that though is heat. It increases the amount of heat that you draw and it puts a lot of pressure on all of your other systems to keep the ship cool. It's kind of an awkward balance. I haven't found any other really good way to set a ship up with plasma accelerators like this. Um, if you happen to have a better way that I'm not aware of, feel free to put a Coriolis build together and link it in the comments. I'm always willing to learn new things because uh, I'm constantly learning new things about this game even after having played it for years. So uh, let's see. I think that's all I've got for today. So I will catch you guys later.